This is Mile High. Do I want to tell the story or do I want to show the message? You've got a lot of work to do between Mile High. The time has come where we can know. We have a responsibility, an ethical and moral responsibility. We have to do it better in order to move people along. Up, down, inside out. If you get your mind right, it is not. It is a receiver of sport. This love is my first technique. It's now time for the show. Welcome to the Mile High Chiropractic Philosophy Summit. Um, I hope you're enjoying all these segments. I know I am, um, and really getting some real deal, in-depth, philosophical conversations so you can be more certain in what you're sharing in community and communi communicating to your practice members. And at this point, that's pretty darn important. It's always important, but even more so, and that's why we're doing this. So thank you for being part of it. And I want to thank the next uh, guest here on this segment, uh, Dr. Dan Lyons, who um, I am a big fan of. Um, he is going to be speaking actually at Mile High 2020. He is a lifelong Wisconsin native, and we will not hold that against him. Um, and after completing his, what did you do without my beer and cheese? <laughs> after completing his undergraduate degree in biology and biochem. He attended uh, Palmer College of Chiropractic and graduated in 96. So two things we share is not only our name, but our same graduation year, uh, different places and uh, been in Green Bay. And he's served um, in many areas in the chiropractic profession, involved, in, he's always been involved in veteran profession. He helps with uh, Gonstead instruction and Gonstead research. He helps with the um, the, the chiropractic diplomat program and the a ACP program. So really grateful for all he does to help better chiropractic and chiropractors. Thank you for joining us here at the Mile High Philosophy Summit. Thank you for having me, Danny. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and, and do you have beer and cheese there? Uh, I do. I do have, I have some cheese. I took the beer home the other day. Some patients own a brewery and they brought me in, but uh, something a lot of people don't know. Good cheese curds, fresh cheese curds, will squeak. And I got these yesterday, and maybe you can hear. Yeah, you do. They can do. you hear the squeak? Yeah. Good cheese curds squeak. I did not realize until I left the state that most people don't realize that they're supposed to squeak. I did not know that. That's something new. I brought someone, some down to Iowa when I went to school, and I, I gave them to some friends, and they were like, what's wrong with these things? I said, what do you mean? They're great. They're like, they squeak. They're supposed to. They're fresh. So. <laughs> and you know what? That is um, a chiropractic principle that we can put in there. Like a lot of people don't necessarily know that an adjustment um, is supposed to be, a, you know, to know that something in adjustment, there was a removal or reduction of interference. People think it has to make some noise, kind of like the result yep. of what you're saying. Right, that doesn't necessarily have to make a noise, but a cheese curd, good cheese curd, would make noise. That's and right. Then, I had a also that you know, um, I'm sure that the process of making cheese curds also does take time. It does take time, a yeah. lot of time, and the longer the time since they were made to the time they go in your mouth, they lose the squeak. Yeah, there you go. So there's chiropractic principles everywhere. They um, are. These are life principles, really. And They're so, in the eye of the beholder. Um, so first, let's just introduce people that don't know you uh, to you, just in terms of at least your, your chiropractic background, your training, what you do. Uh, you know, I, I, I take care of people just like everybody else. But <laughs> I, I went to Palmer, Davenport, started in 92, graduated in 96. And while I was there, I had the, the good fortune of interning with Larry Troxell, who was a friend of Dr. Gonstead's, and uh, I've been teaching for GMI and uh, GCSS for about 24 years, and I'm on the uh, Center for Chiropractic Progress board as well. I'm on the GMI and the GCSS board and the Center for board, and we put on the Philosophy Diplomate, and along with uh, Mile High's own Joel Kinch, we were part of the, the first class for the first year, which was the Legion of Chiropractic Philosophers, the LCP. And then shortly after that, the diplomate started and we were part of that class as well. And so 
uh, doing a lot of a uh, lot of stuff. We've had to rearrange that schedule. We currently have a diplomate class going on and we canceled. We had a weekend in March that we canceled before everything got locked down because half the class is coming in from outside the country. And at, at that point, no one was supposed to be coming in or going out. But then by the time the end, uh, the end of the month rolled around, you know, half the states were wanting to lock down and we had shelter in place orders. So we're trying to do a little bit of online stuff, you know, Zoom like this stuff is, is wonderful. We get to connect. So, um, but it's just, you know, every day, get up, look for subluxations, uh, correct them, do a little bit of writing, do a little bit of speaking, try and help everybody be a little bit better every single day. Sounds like my life. Mm -hmm. Well, you it know, goes with the first name. Yeah, that's what it is. And so we were talking just before uh, starting this uh, segment of the Mile High Philosophy Summit, and we well, again want well, to thank you for participating um, about different chiropractic principles. And you mentioned a important one. Well, they're all important, but uh, seven uh, principle seventeen, which is cause and effect. That every effect has a cause, and every cause has an effect. Now, I would imagine that um, getting cheese curds that have a good noise. There's, there's, a, there's a process to that, and you have to do that right, and there's a cause and effect to that. Um, but let's bring that to chiropractic. Uh, talk about what does that principle mean? Uh, you know, that's kind of the linchpin. You're about halfway through, and, you know, chiropractors, we, we focus on the subluxation all day long, and we forget that subluxation is 31 out of 33. You know, so you've got 30 principles before you get to subluxation. It's, uh, it's, uh, so you're, you're staring at one thing and you, you miss the whole big picture. And the first half of the principles are kind of setting the foundation for the second half. You know, you're, you're more esoteric, I guess would be a good word in the first half. But in the second half is where we start to look in how are they applicable to the human body. And so some people, when you hear the, the phrase, one cause, one cure, most people jump right to the subluxation, and, and that's, that's incorrect. There is a cause, but it, it, subluxation is a cause of interference. It's not necessarily the cause of interference. And uh, when you're looking at your analysis, so whatever tools you use to analyze the spine, there is a cause for that finding. And subluxation may or may not be the cause of the finding that you have at that moment. And that's the hard part, especially if you only have, you know, one tool in your tool basket. If you are, if you, all you do is, is motion palpation, which is, is very common in the profession. If all you use motion palpation, there's, you're missing a lot of stuff. You don't know if there's any interference at that level. You're just finding a fixation. If you don't have an x-ray, you know, maybe there's a reason that it's stuck there. Maybe there's facet tropism. Maybe you have disc degeneration. Maybe you have ankylosing spondylitis. There's all kinds of things. And so that one I, I love because it gets blamed for a lot of things. It's a scapegoat and it's a realistic reason for some of the things that we see in the office. And that is super important. It's important, super important to take the principles and how do you put them into real world application with your practice members? Because they're all very real. And I remember one of the detractors for chiropractic philosophy back as a student was, oh, well, philosophy is not practical. But it's, I know, right? It, it, you hit your head against the wall. It, it's uh -huh. the most practical thing that you can have uh, and, and the foundation. Can, can you? Share a little bit about why philosophy is important as a, as a whole. Yeah, um, we were talking as earlier. You did this. <laughs> Dr. Barge, in his book Life Without Fear, said that the the understanding and having a good working knowledge of our philosophy and our principles is what gives us what he called a, a life without fear, and it, that is so necessary today. You know the the difference between. A, a person or a chiropractor, let's say, who is terrified of this disease, has zero comorbidities, and is terrified 
and shutting down our office and not going to be open for a long, long time. And then with certain restrictions and someone that is, uh, you know, in the office every day, no comorbidities or maybe even a couple very, very minor ones, uh, like maybe being a little, little gray, you know, the, the difference is an understanding of the, the philosophy and those things. And it is, it, it's shocking to see the difference. And when I hear people not understanding what they, what they do, it is the foundation of everything we do. Without a philosophy, all you have is a statistic and statistics are like bikinis. You know, what they reveal is interesting, but what they conceal, now that's vital. And so you don't know what to do with it. Philosophy makes the science relevant. And to say that it is, it's not necessary is the most ludicrous thing in the world. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, actually, in one of the interviews that we did, uh, Matthew Alvarod uh, yes. said, From Minnesota. That, yeah, um, he said that, well, it's not that they're not learning chiropractic philosophy, they're just learning a different philosophy, medical philosophy, right? It's not that they, you know, a lot of people don't realize that they have a philosophy. It's just yeah. not, not um, they've not evaluated their philosophy. Well, it's like uh, the Ayn Rand's quote from, what was it, the uh, address to West Point, you know, as a human being, you, there is, uh, what is it, as a human being, you have no choice about your need for philosophy. Your only choice is whether you have created your philosophy through rational study, logical deliberation, et cetera, et cetera, or do you let it, uh, ac do you accumulate a, a junk heap of slogans and half truths and, and lies that accumulate like an anchor where your mind's wings should have grown? I paraphrase that, but, right, but right. It, it's a choice. You either have one or the other. You either have a chiropractic philosophy or you have something else, but you have a philosophy. And if you don't know it, that is the real tragedy. Right. Or and Ayn Rand talked about having a mongrel philosophy. That's just all. That's, yeah, the mongrel right, philosophy. Right. Just all yeah. thrown together. So, um, and so then when someone has a very well delineated, and I, I, I have no doubt that for you, it's going to be the same as me. Like my philosophy is continuing to grow. It doesn't stop. It's not like a, you, you don't, you, you finish, um, reviewing it and then you don't do it anymore it's it's an ongoing process it's part of your life um so but when someone is embracing ph uh, philosophical constructs relative to their care how does that then show up into the results of them uh for the quality of care that they end up delivering uh it's i think it shows up a couple different ways it shows up in your the the way you analyze the spine mm -hmm. uh, you know, your understanding of what you're looking at. And so when you start out, when you're first in practice, you're, you're not good. I mean, you haven't done it over. It's like shooting a free throw. If you shot, you know, when you're in school, I think we said this last time, if you shot 250 free throws, because you need 250 patient visits to graduate, if you shot 250 free throws in a year, uh, you wouldn't be very good, but you shoot 250 in a week, you're going to get pretty good pretty fast. So you get part of it is just are your hands good and those those connections between the motor cortex and your your hands so what you're doing but then understanding what you're seeing and being able to to incorporate everything that you've learned and everything that you've done with this patient and all your other patients and seeing the results and being able to figure out why sometimes it seems to work and sometimes it doesn't you know Dr. Gonson said chiropractic always works. When it appears not to, examine your application, but do not question the principle. And so you always have to look back. Chiropractic always works. You interfere with the nervous system, there's always a bad result. But if you think you found a subluxation and you think you uh, corrected or lessened it and the patient has no result, then you had probably failed in some way and better go back. But a lot of people will blame that on 24, you know, principle 24, you know, the limitations of matter. Couldn't do that. Bring up. Yeah. You know, 
and I, I, you know, some of those, you know, so six, uh, 17 and 24 are kind of like my, my, uh, I, I pick on them a lot because they get used at it as excuses, you know, was it really limitations of matter or did you not give it enough six? Uh, you know, early on in practice, I had a, a patient that had come in and I got him, you know, he was like 50, 60% better. I couldn't get him past that hump. And so I sent him back to, he started seeing me because I was close and I did the same thing as his chiropractor. And because I was new, it was easier to get in. And uh, he said, what are we going to do? And I just rolled up and filmed, stuck the travel card in him, said, you know, go back and see Harvey. And so uh, about a month later, he showed back up in the office on a Saturday and said, you know, I just want to ma maintain. And so Monday I called Harvey. I said, what did I, what did I do wrong? He says, I looked at your films. You, they looked right. I looked at your travel card, made sense. I did what you did six more times and he was better. He goes, I just think you didn't give it enough time. You expected too much. So mm -hmm. we can't control any of those principles. We can't control time. Uh, we can't control what the patient does outside our office. We can advise and, and we don't know that our advice is necessarily right. I mean, obviously there's some, some common sense things you can, you can advise them on, but once they, they heal, they heal. And, and your analysis, you have to be looking at what's going on in the nervous system. We don't have a tool that actually looks at the nervous system. So, you know, most of us will use some type of thermography or surface EMG uh, to monitor changes, HRV to monitor changes. And, it, you know, you go with the, what I call the Goldilocks syndrome. So it's, you know, too high, too low, just right. You know, can an HRV be too high? Certainly, especially at certain moments in time. So to say I raised HRV, good, maybe, we don't know. So you always have to have, you know, pattern. That's one of the beauties of pattern analysis. And when you look at those three principles and apply them logically to your to your day-to-day -day practice, you start to see see patterns of success and patterns where they you don't succeed. And in, in many ways it's humbling because you realize that you know you're just a little bitty cog in this whole machine. And you're talking you talked about mentioned a principle 24 and I, I want to state it for people. Oh. Right? So uh, the limits of adaptation and intelligence adapts forces and matter for the body as long as it can do so without breaking a universal law or any intelligence is limited by the limitations of matter. Now, the important thing is so often people will say, as you just said, limitations of matter is like, well, the person didn't get better. So, oh yeah, well, you know, limitations of matter. But then there's that question, well, do we know they were really clear? Or is it really a situation of limitations of matter? Exactly. You know, if you, if you aren't, taking the appropriate number six, we got to speak in code. You know, you just hold up number six and 17 and 24 and, uh, you know, 28. <laughs> got to have flashcards here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you, we don't know uh, what's the saying, you know, don't be upset with the results you didn't get from the work you didn't do. So if, if you aren't doing some form of instrumentation or, or to, determine is the nervous system functioning the way it should how do you know if, if all you are is is looking at an x-ray you know you don't know how that joint is actually moving if uh, just because you increased a curve doesn't mean you removed any interference so there's there's exactly. different parts of the puzzle and really if you're going to be healthy all the pieces of the puzzle have to be fit put together you can't just put two of them together and say we're good. Well, and, and there you go. I, one of the things that I've seen chiropractors do at times is, hey, you know, I've checked this practice member. Their spine, nerve system seems clear relative to how I've checked them. Can you please check and see if I've missed every, anything? You know, or, or can you assess them a different way to see if maybe I have there's subluxations that I've missed, right? because we want to make sure that we've really done all that we can. Absolutely. And, you know, the analysis, which is, you know, kind of my, that's my soapbox, you know, uh, adjusting, there's, uh, we should have 
and, and work on finding the best way. And I do believe that there is a best way that for checking the spine, a comprehensive way. Adjusting, now, you know, there's lots of different ways to adjust. Some ways are, are better than other. You know, adjusting with a knee in the back, probably not a good way. It might be effective once in a while, but uh, you know, I'm not gonna be the guy on the receiving end of that. Um, and, you know, that, that's really where the, the artistic expression is. And just because it worked this time and last time doesn't mean it's going to work next time. And, but we get stuck in those things, you know, in the Gonstead world, you typically have, uh, you got the pelvic bench for, for the pelvis and the lower lumbars, and then you go to the, the knee chest or the high low, and then the cervicals are in the chair. But sometimes you have to do the lumbars in the chair, and sometimes you have to do the cervicals, you know, prone on the knee chest or the high low, but we forget about it because it works last time. And, and, you know, when you go to, the, when you go to seminars, they teach to do the cervicals in the chair. We don't teach a lot of uh, the prone stuff we're starting to, but you have to figure out what the subluxation is. And then I think we're all smart enough to figure out, you know, you look at your x-ray, you look at your palpation findings, you look at your, your, uh, your visualization, you look at the patient history, you look at your instrumentation and then you put all those together and say, oh, I'm going to have to adjust it this way. And you try that a few times, give it a little six, you know, you give a little 24, a little adaptation, <laughs> is it working? And, uh, you, you know, you are the 17 and life is a little 17 in there. And then you're like, okay, we get a result. So that, that cause and effect worked or it didn't. And then you have to figure out a different 17 to add in there. And, and, and I love the speaking in code. It's almost like, um, what's that show? Get smart, right? Oh, exactly. <laughs> We're in the cone of silence. <laughs> so now, um, 17, cause and effect, going back to that. One of the things, one of my mentors and, or big influences um, was Reggie Gold. And, you know, he always said in his, in his presentations, I heard, it, heard him say it so many times, you know, that it's the law of cause and effect, not the law of cause and side effect, Right. So, uh, can you speak to that somewhat? Uh, yeah, there's a lot. You know, there is the difference between an effect and a side effect is just how you label it. Um, you know, when if you pick up the physician's desk reference, and it for like Tylenol, I did this a couple of weeks ago, and when I copied and pasted into Word, I had 120 pages of side effects. Mm. They're not side effects. They're just, a, it's just cause and effect. Right. Uh, something you don't want. So you adjust the patient and they say, hey, doc, I got a headache after that last adjustment. Uh, you know, that is a, a improper effect. The adjustment should never get a headache. And I hate it when patients come in, new patients that have seen someone else and are like, hey, man, that adjustment didn't, didn't, wasn't a good one. I'm like, how do you know? I haven't checked you yet. They said, well, I didn't get a headache after I got adjusted. No lie. I hear this way, way, way too often. I'm like, do you want a headache? No. Um, you should not get a headache after an adjustment ever. If you do, you know, I tell every single patient, I said, you know, I'm not perfect. So I, I do my best. And if you don't feel right, if there's something that is definitely different and you don't like it, don't leave, just, you know, get back in the queue and we'll check and we'll, we'll see if there's something I missed or if my effect, uh, my cause had an effect that became another cause. So remember it says uh, every effect has a cause and every cause has effect. So your adjustment is the, the cause, the effect is what happens. Uh, sometimes the effect is not what you want, and that becomes a cause of something else. And it's just this little circle that goes down. Now, hopefully it's a good circle going up to the sky. Sometimes it's a bad circle going down the toilet. So you have to check. That's why you, you should be doing a post check, you know, you, so you know you did what you wanted to. And if you have patients, if your patients are getting headaches afterwards, especially if it's right after now, if it's, you know, a day later, they come in and try and blame you, you know, some pay you, we all get people that try and do that. You know, that adjustment gave me a headache. When? I got it a day later. 
well, you know, you're in Wisconsin, you probably had too much beer. So we don't, we don't know. The longer principle six goes from an adjustment, you don't know if any symptoms they have are, are effects of your cause. Well, now, and here's a very important thing of why you can analyze, you know, see things through this philosophical lens, since you use the example of beer, right? So you could have beer and there's a desired effect that people want with beer, right? Which is to have some, um, you know, uh, intoxication, it's a, right? It's they, a they, social they, lubricant. It's a social lubricant. There's some level of intoxication that they want, not too much, but a certain amount mm -hmm. of, that they want. And then a side effect is the uh you may have a hangover but it's not really a side effect it's it's an effect it's an effect it's an effect um but also that side effect forward slash effect can also be a sign of life which is another principle yes absolutely just because you don't like the the expression doesn't mean it's inappropriate right you know? um you know, the purpose of, of matter is to express the force mm -hmm. and the intelligence. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes you're supposed to feel like crap. Right. You know? um, the, yeah. So that effect that we don't like, uh, the hangover, you're supposed to feel that way. Yeah. It's so, to teach you not to, you know, overindulge in the cause. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that, to and to keep you from going out and uh, overexerting, so you conserve energy, so your body can heal the damage that you did. Right, exactly, and that's something for us to all realize. Like you, for example, you have an adjustment, and it could be, well, I had a I had a headache afterwards, or threw up afterwards, or keep going down the list. But at the same time, part of like you talked about having an appropriate analysis and objective outcomes part of determining whether it was enough six, enough 24 or 17, was that you assessed in some objective measure that, well, well actually we do have to see a clear nerve system, what's going on with you could be a sign of life. Exactly, exactly. In, um, in uh, the Green Book uh, clinical, uh, controlled clinical studies. Yes. Um, uh, I forget, what is it, case 1560, I think it is. It's a story of a, a young man who was having horrible, horrible seizures, and he got sent down to see BJ, and BJ adjusted him, and then uh, it was right around, I want to say it was around Thanksgiving time when he came in, and he adjusted him once, and he would check him every day, and the guy got up to the point where he's having like 280 seizures a right. day, just horrible ones. And BJ was like, nope, he's clear. I'm not adjusting. He's clear, he's clear, he's clear. And then all of a sudden they just stopped and the guy was fine. And then he, he went home <clears throat> and he, had, he came back two times. One time he had been in a car accident and he started having seizures again and BJ adjusted him and then went away. And then he had some dental work that screwed him up. And then they didn't hear from him again. So they assumed that he was doing fine. But to sit there and have the the intestinal fortitude to s watch this person just go through hundreds of seizures a day and say he does not need an adjustment and know that all of a sudden have everything that you've been saying for those 30 days come true and the, the seizures stop. That's amazing. Right. That Absolutely. is complete understanding. And, you know, it goes beyond not just having faith in the 33 principles, but but really, really living them. Right. Um, it was like a BJ, BJ tried to join the, uh, the Freemasons and you have to petition and they come and interview you. And they, one of the questions is, do you believe in God? And BJ would say no and the, the guys would get up and leave. And it happened like three times and one of his friends finally came in and said, uh, said to BJ, you know, why, why do you keep saying you don't believe in God? And BJ said, I, I don't believe in God. I know God exists. And to have that kind of understanding and grounding in the philosophy and the principles is what lets you do stuff like that. Wow. And, that, and that's vital in practice and excellence. And I will tell you, I, I discuss things with many chiropractors around the world regularly. And when people often 
um, struggle in different areas of practice. Um, they, their philosophy is, tends to be weaker. They tend to have a lack of certainty relative to the application of chiropractic and that can stem from where their philosophical understanding is. Um, I, I, Dan, Dr. Dan, I, I just cannot emphasize enough how what a great resource of wisdom you are. Um, and I'd like to just take one more, more moment for you to share what are the ways. Now, you, you use some, you know, terms uh, at the beginning, GSM, and G, that people may not know what they are or how to plug into those. Can you do that between the, the Gonstead methodologies and also the diplomat program? Can you just tell how people can get to, to, uh, link into those? Certainly. So... Um, uh, if you go to gonsteadmethodology.com, that's the GMI website, uh, there's some resources there. We list our seminars and hopefully someday we get to start having them soon. We had to cancel our biggest seminar. We have three seminars a year at Mount Horeb and then two just north of, of Davenport, Iowa, where Palmer is. And, you know, we teach, you know, basically everything you're going to do in the office there. Our biggest seminar of the year, the one we had to cancel, we, we co-teach with Gonstead Clinical Study Society. And so there's a lot more resources there. That's gonstead.com. And the, uh, there's a, a lot of papers that you can look at, a lot of uh, stu studies that have been published. There's also a referral directory if you're looking for someone to maybe in your area to take care of you, to refer a patient to, or just to go hang out and, and sit and learn from. And then there is the, the chiroprogress.org, which is the Center for Chiropractic Progress. And that's where we put on uh, the, the philosophy diplomate. And uh, we don't have a lot up there. There's a link. So if you wanted to buy, we also put on the, um, the three research symposiums, adaptability research symposiums. And we do have copies of those for sale. So if you're interested, you can go online there and find those. Those were great seminars focused. Uh, we would have a, a legitimate PhD researchers come in and they would be the main speakers, uh, Rob Sinnott, Brad Polk, myself, uh, a couple others, John Goodfellow spoke, um, Lyle Coaches spoke at, at one of them. Um, uh, there was a handful of other chiropractors, but it was mostly we would have these PhDs come in and talk about how what we do, you know, impacted the nervous system. Uh, they're all neurologists and generally focused on HRV and how what we did made changes in HRV. The last one, uh, we had uh, a doctor get checked, HRV, and then adjusted by a young chiropractor, guys out of school two, maybe three years at the time, and saw enormous changes. And the, it's funny because the, the changes I get sometimes on HRV, I was like, yeah, I was like, oh man, that's not what I wanted to see. But these guys are like sitting in the back with their eyes this big, these you know, big time researchers. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Bernson's professor emeritus at the Ohio State University. And uh, legally, you have to say that or they find you. They find you online. They find you if you don't say the V. But, uh, uh, you know, he was shocked at the changes that we could get from one adjustment on the HRV. You know? So those are, those are the three big things that you can, you can get into and really dive deep. It, it makes a world of difference. Regardless of what you're going to do for your own methodology in the office, Make sure it is philosophically sound and and get great at it. Get great at it. Because yeah. and, jumping yeah. from, from methodology to methodology doesn't get you good at anything. And I will tell you, even um, refining the methodology you do as yourself, um, objective outcomes, I remember, uh, a little bit of a tangent, uh, but I want to just wrap it up with this because it, it applies to 6, 17, and 24. Um, having instrumentation in my office and being nervous and thinking, well, what if I'm awful? What if, what if uh, I'm not getting the changes? And then realizing I got good changes, but they could be better. Same thing when I started having x-rays in my office. I was like, oh, what if I start taking them and people you know, don't improve in some structural way? 
right? But then I saw them change and then I could refine it even better. But that, you, you, those tools are there for you to develop as a chiropractor, not to prove that you're good, but to help you get good. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you don't ever measure it, you don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, seeing changes on the x-rays is the toughest one yep. because we always tend to, the only time people tend to x-ray, especially when they start out, is when things are bad. So right. if you only take x-rays of people when they're, when they come in and they, they hurt or their symptoms, whatever brings them into the office is really bad, then you're never going to see what they look like when they're good. You're never going to see the changes you make. Right. So I want to thank you. And I want to encourage everybody who watched the segment, Doc, Dr. Dan um, just shared a whole bunch of resources and places to plug into. If you want to grow in your technique, uh, specifically gone through there, and if you want to grow in your knowledge and grow as a philosopher, he gave you great resources. And, and look, it's, it's no secret. And it's part of why we're putting on this philosophy summit. It's no secret that chiropractic education worldwide has less philosophy in it than it needs to, right? It needs a lot more than it. So for you to certainly does with those great resources will help you just be a better chiropractor. And hopefully you dedicate your life uh, to chiropractic to help people and you want to do a darn good job at it. So uh, thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate you taking the time to contribute. You bet, Danny. It was a pleasure. I always love talking to you and, and hanging out with you. Looking forward to seeing you out in Denver this summer. Yes, we'll see you there. Thank you for changing spines, minds, and lives. And watch out, watch for the next segment coming at you in the summit here. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.